It's great to be with you guys again. It's a beautiful day to be on the deck outside. So, you know, if you're looking for something to do right after church, hang out a little bit uh, because it's beautiful outside. And I, I heard, I saw on the forecast, like 77 is like the high, 79, something like that for Thursday. I'll believe it when I see it, just so we know. I just want to say that, but it's, it's exciting again to be going through October. Uh, if you would, access the notes on your phone or have your Bible out ready to, to jump in today as we explore the last week of I'm In. And a real quick question, are we in? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, very good. We're in for right now, so we'll see how we go from here. But basically, we've been looking and unpacking different things from the, that, from the Word of God that we're supposed to be embracing as a church. Things that we're supposed to realize that, that we are better together. And so even that video clip that started each series, you have to call off by itself. You get isolated by yourself. You, you get to run out of heat a little bit. You get, get, to, you get, get to cool off a little bit. But once you get together with the fire, you, you get back on fire personally. You get back uh, on fire and realize that your goal, again, to be part of something bigger than ourselves. That's what we are as the church. And so a few weeks ago, we invited us to embrace the fact that we are invited. We're invited to be part of the family of God. We don't earn our way in. God in His goodness adopts us and He has us be part of His family so that we get to be called a uh, son or daughter of the King all because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for you and for me. So the invitation is open for us and for all who would believe. And so our job is to again invite as many people as possible to the table because they are invited to be part of the family of God. A week two we saw that as the family of God we are all gifted for spiritual work and that work because it's God's work, it's invaluable. So you are an invaluable part of the family of God. And so we didn't include this quiz, we went over this, but I wanted to include it right now. So we have a quick quiz up here to determine if you should serve in church or not. So basically, again, if you see red watermelon, you are normal. If you see a green watermelon, you're a little bit odd, but if you see a blue watermelon right there on the screen right now, that is your test. That means you need to volunteer at church, right? So just so we're aware of that, I just wanted to do a side note. So many of you do and are so faithful to serve. Thank you for being part of that. But hey, if you see blue, just saying, you might want to realize that you are part of the invaluable work of God. So as we continue last week, we saw that uh, all of us are influencers. All of us are able to make a difference. And simply put, you and I have no idea how one word of encouragement how one note of thanks, how one, uh, just maybe even a, a verse or a scripture that we pass on to somebody else, you and I have no idea how, how even a little bit of influence can go a long way. So you are salt, you are light, I am salt, I am light, we are part of the family of God, and we are influencers. And I love the fact, again, you don't have to wait till you have it all together to influence someone for Christ. We said from the very beginning here at Oasis Church, no perfect people allowed. Listen, we are all a work in progress, and God's able to use us in progress, in the process, and to be uh, able to build and, and build His kingdom. And today we want to realize again that you and I, we are invested. We are invested in the kingdom of God. We are to be invested in the work of God. And so maybe you say, as we begin today, you say, you know what, Jeremy? I, truthfully, I'm not invested into the kingdom of God. I want to share with you today how we can be and what that looks like for all of us to realize that we are the church. And it's okay if you're not invested in the kingdom of God yet. But I do want to begin the conversation today by simply helping us realize we're all invested in something. All of us are invested in something. Uh, for instance, today I'm wearing a Jaguars golf shirt here today. And that represents that all of us, we are invested in our sports teams. If you follow sports, if you like sports, you're invested in those teams. Some of us, we get the season tickets. Some of us just get tickets every now and then. Uh, all of us, perhaps at some level, maybe you watch and spend the amount of time, uh, hours investing in watching your team play, getting the apparel, wearing it alongside with them. It makes you feel like you're part of the team and you're cheering and yelling with that as well. So we're all invested in some way. And listen, if you're invested and you buy the tickets, you go when it's hot 
or when it's freezing in the upper 60s. I mean, you go and watch those Jaguars games no matter what. And we recognize that. Well, we're invested whether they win or, or lose. Even a few weeks ago, I, I did my facial hair like, like Gardner Minshew. I was invested. I was like, I'm jumping in. I'm on the bandwagon. Let's do this, right? So all of us, you may not be invested in the kingdom of God, but you're invested somewhere. For some of us, uh, you're invested. And we find out what's interesting again. That if we offer a free financial class, we get a lot of sign-ups for a free financial class. But when the, the, the day comes, or the week comes, we go, you know what? I'm kind of busy. I'm kind of tired that day. I am really, don't really care about that. But when we say, listen, this is Financial Peace University, and it costs $100 be part of this class. Even though you're already strapped financially, you pay that, that money, you, you take that investment level to the next level, you say, you know what, because I paid for it, even though I'm tired, I'm going. And even though we're busy, I'm going to be there. And even though my kids are cranking, it'd be better to, to watch the football game at home, I'm going to be there. That's why Financial Peace University is the best attended small group in the history of Oasis Church. I think we need to start charging be part of small groups from now on. That would make a big difference in people's lives. So what do we see there? We see an investment. If it's free, I'm not really bought in. But when it costs money, even though I'm already wanting, I'm already struggling with debt, I'm more invested. I want to make sure I'm there. Same way it's true. Maybe many of us are here, you drive a car like I do. It's over 10 years old. And people are like, you got your kids in there. People are like, hey, can we eat in your car? Yeah, you can eat my car. You can eat. You can drink. You can pour your drink on the ground. It doesn't. I don't mean it's like an older car. I'm like, you know, it is what it is. But you get a brand new car, right? And people say, can you eat in here? You say, no, you can't eat. You can't even breathe. I don't like your stink breath. Messing up a new car smell, right? It is there. Like you're, you're wrapping your kids in plastic, right? You don't want them to touch up and you know, mess up anything, right? Why? Because it's an investment. You invested in that car. You invested in that. And there's going to be a different way that you feel about that. So all of us are investing in certain things that you just simply are. And you and I, again, we, we invest in things and, and maybe again, the problem we want to kind of uncover is many of us, maybe not all of us, but maybe as we, if we look at our investments, what we're really investing in, maybe many of us are investing in things that quite honestly, they don't last. They don't last. They don't last too long uh, beyond today. Again, you watch that three-hour football game and guess what? It's over. And, and there really is no far-reaching game. Whether they win or lose, you can't get those three hours back. I'm not saying that guilt wise I'm not saying you can't enjoy entertainment. But I'm just saying, hey, listen, if it's investment, it, it doesn't last in those things. Same thing, we all get cars and they, they all get older. And we want to realize the different things. And maybe some of us, maybe we're investing in things that don't last. Jesus spoke about this over and over again. In fact, he says this in Matthew 6, 19. He says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat. And eat them and rust destroys them. And where thieves break in and steal. You say, listen, be very careful how you live your life. Make sure that all your treasures are not here on earth. Don't store up things just here on earth. Because what happens? Well, people steal things. And maybe you've experienced that firsthand and know someone who has. You've, you've earned it. You've, you've bought it. You've saved up for it. And then someone came and took it. And it's gone. Just like that. Maybe again, we, we dealt with stuff where, where you, you put money in the stock market and, and the stock loses money and you lose money in your investments as well. You understand what that's like. I think all of us can relate that we buy something and we save up for it. We really, really want it. And then for whatever reason, it ends up in our garage. And then we're like, you know what? Maybe tomorrow I could slap a $2 sticker on it. Maybe someone would just buy it, would just take it from me out of, out of garage. Maybe I'll just offer it this whole lot. Take everything for two bucks, all right? What do we see in that moment? Well, things lose value over time. Things lose that we give our money to, then they don't really last beyond that moment. So perhaps we're investing in things that, that don't last. And so uh, Jesus gives this warning and, and he comes to understand, listen, don't store up things here on earth. I think the truth we want to go back to over and over again is that as a people, as a church, our God has created us to pour, not to store. Our God has created us to make sure that we have loose hands with the things that God has given us, not just to hold things on to ourselves and, and hold on to them with the grip that it's all about our stuff, our stuff, our stuff. He's created us to pour, not to store. And Jesus taught over and over again, it's more blessed to give than receive. Now, right now, you think, oh, no, no, no. Jeremy, is this a giving message? It is a giving message, just so you know, right? So don't panic. Don't freak out, just so you're aware of that, right? Because, here's the thing, when it comes to a giving message, as Oasis Church, our belief is it's not really about money. It's never about the money. It's always about the heart. It's always about what God has in mind for us as a people, as a church, even more so than giving financially. 
And even here today, we want to focus on giving and investing, not just finances, although that is an important part of the work of God in the church and uh, through every generation. But it's also giving our, our time, it's giving our energy, it's giving our, our heart to the things that God cares about. And making sure, again, that our heart aligns with His because we seek to love Him above all else with our whole heart, whole mind, and whole soul. And so we believe, again, if you really get a hold of this principle of it's better to pour than to store, it's better to give than receive, this really is a life-changing transformation principle for us. And we don't, again, again, not just finances, but everything of who we are. That we're created to pour rather than store. Even when it comes down to the kind of stories that we want to tell. And the kind of stories that we love to hear. Very rarely do we love to hear emotional spending stories. Very, we don't really like to hear those things, right? Like for instance, you know, you're having a, a tough time and going through life. Kind of wondering what your purpose is. And feel like you're missing something. Something is missing out. And then you see the commercial for the new iPhone 11. And it was like... Ah, like that's what's missing. You knew in that moment you needed a phone with three cameras. That's what was missing from your life. That's what was missing. You were longing and waiting for this moment. And there on the TV screen in front of you, ah, iPhone 11. And so you went down and even though you had just bought a brand new phone last year, was still in your contract, still worked perfectly, you traded that bad boy in because you knew that you needed the next Level 11 iPhone, three cameras. Yes, thank you, Lord. That's what was missing. Don't you want that too? Now, some of us, again, we realize, okay, is that the story I really want to be telling? Is that really going to fulfill? Is that really going to last? You see, emotional spending stories, whether that's that or, or, the, or the jewelry or the new car, if we went and took on more debt. And, and those stories, again, they're really all about us. So they don't inspire. They don't really encourage. They don't really expand the kingdom. Are they bad in and of themselves? No, they're not bad in and of themselves. I mean, iPhone is great. But is that, is that all we're, we're after? Versus the different kind of story. It's the giving story. It's the story, again, where, you know, you're, you're in line at, at the store and the people in front of you, they have a lot of kids and, and they're trying to, they're, they, it all adds up. And they're kind of looking at their wallet and they have to make a choice. Hey, do we put some of this food back or do we put the diapers back? And you say, no, you know what, put the diapers, I, I, I'll take care of the diapers and just give it to you guys. And you tell a story like that and people's hearts start to beat a little faster. You're like, oh, yeah, I, I want to be able to do that as well. And you see the story again of someone asking for, for money. You don't have a lot of money yourself, but you say, you know what, can I just buy you some, uh, some food over here and I'll bring it back to you. And they're like, yeah, here's what I want. And, and you just go again and have the goodness of, again, because you realize that God has blessed you and you realize, you know what, I don't, I don't have a lot, but I can do something. And you go and give that and that inspires and people, even again, in the, when it comes to giving, offering and learning to, to trust the Lord financially. We, we have stories all the time where people say, you know what, I, I didn't have a lot of money, but... I knew I was supposed to trust God with what I did have. And so I, I cut that check, depending on how some of us, how old some of us are, or, or, or I, I got, got the cash, and some of us just, you know, depending on how old we are, I, I went online and I put my information in. And you know what? I just started to do it, and I saw that God can be trusted. And you hear that story of just small steps of faith, small steps of generosity, small steps of being willing to be invested in the kingdom of God. And that's the story that makes our heart beat faster when we hear it. And that's the story I think that we want to tell and teach our kids. To say, hey, it's better to give than receive. It's better to, 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 take, to take care of others and be always so worried about what's in our account, what's in our, our situation. Now, listen, I think again, sometimes we get upset about a giving message or a giving message challenge because we feel like we don't have enough. You know, I, I would love to give, but I just don't have a lot. I, I would love to do more, but I really don't have that much to begin with. And, and really what it is, it really starts with a scarcity mindset. And what you and I do in this mindset, we say, okay, here's what I'll do, God. I'll make a deal with you. When I get the raise, then I'll start to be generous. Right? Like when I start making more money, when I get this amount in savings, when this happens, when my, my kids move out of the house, when, when these things happen, right, then we'll do this. And in that mindset, unless we're careful, we get to, we, it's easy for us to, to fall into a scarcity mindset. And here's the thing. The Bible teaches, again, not a scarcity mindset, but an abundance mindset. It, it, the Bible teaches that it all belongs to God. It's all His. And He's given us some of it, and we're to manage it for His kingdom. We're to manage what we do have for His kingdom, to invest in that. 
And so it's not about a certain amount. It's not saying, hey, when you pass the $10,000 a month threshold, then you start giving. They're simply saying, God, will I trust you with whatever amount I have and give you a portion back of that? Will I trust you and see with whatever time I have or whatever energy I have, will I trust you to give a portion back of what you have first given to me? I think, again, it's fear versus faith. Fear says, I, I got to have more. I, I got to have more in storage. I got to have more saved up. Faith says, here's what I do have. And I'm going to trust you with this. It's fear versus faith. So Jesus tells some stories for us. And we see some stories in the Gospels that tell us more about what it looks like to, to say no to the scarcity mindset and say yes to the abundance mindset so that we realize that we really are created to pour and not to store. You tell the story in Luke 12, starting in verse 16, we read this. So Jesus told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Time out really quick, okay? The man is a rich man. And he is, we see here that he's had fertile crops, okay? So who allowed those crops to grow? God did, okay? God owns the land. He, the man might be paying on it, but it's really God's land, all right? He created it. God allowed the crops to grow. God allowed the rain to fall on it. God allowed the birds and the bugs to stay away. So God has definitely blessed this young man. Is it wrong to be blessed by God? Absolutely not. Is it wrong to work hard and have finances? Absolutely not. But here's what, where it goes wrong. This guy's attitude is not about, God, thank you for what you've done. He simply says, what should I do? I don't have room for all of these crops that, that God has given me. And so Jesus tells the story. He said, I know. I'll tear down my barns. I'll build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all of my wheat and my other goods. And when I have all this stuff stored up, then what I'll do? Verse 19, I'll sit back. And say to myself, my friend, I love how he talks about himself in the third person. My friend, like the rock, the rock, right? So my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. And God has blessed this guy in a big way. This guy says, what can I do? I, I need more room. So yes, I have buildings, but they're not big enough. Let me tear those buildings down. Uh, yeah, I have storehouses right now, but... Let's get rid of those and build bigger ones. And then when I have all those bigger ones filled up, then I'll take time off and relax. Look how much I've done. I'll look how much I have stored up. It's all about me, me, me. What is he doing? Instead of pouring, he's storing. And Jesus says, but God says to this man, verse 20, you will die this very night. In fact, he says, the choices you're making, those are foolish choices. Then who will get everything you worked for? He gets a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Again, is this speaking against wealth? No. Is it speaking against having a savings account? No. But it is speaking against this idea that it's all about us. That it's all about my life and my moment and my happiness. And Jesus says, listen, for every single one of us, there will come a time when our life will end. And in that moment, has it been all about us and all what's happening here on earth? If, if that's so, then the Bible, Jesus says, that's a foolish way to live. But a wise way is to be certain, to have to be rich toward the things that God says are important. To be invested in His work, to be invested in His kingdom, to realize it's all His. When we have a scarcity mindset, we're driven by fear. I got to keep this. I got to guard it. I got to protect it. I got a story. And quite honestly, this is true for all of us. This is, honestly, this is me this past week. It's all about mine, mine. Not financial stuff, but church, but people. It's a scarcity mindset. And before the Lord, He wants us to have an abundance mindset. God owns it all. We are His church. We belong to Him. All the land is His. All the money is His. All the resources are His. It all is His. And what does God say? God says that He is good. God says that He loves His kids. And that He loves to, as a perfect father, perfect father loves to bless His kids and take care of them. And in God's mindset, abundance, there's more than enough. More than enough. 
And we can sit and rest and relax and worship and trust Him with what we have. You see, this is fear versus faith. Now, when it comes to giving of our time and our energy and our finances, God, I'd love to have more. I wish I had more time. God, I wish I had more energy. God, I wish I had more money. We can have a scarcity mindset. And God, when I get more of these things, then I'll trust you. Or we say, God, you give me some right now. I'll trust you with what I have right now. I'll trust you right here, right now, in this moment. And I believe, again, as we choose to have that mindset, God honors that because it's a God-honoring mindset. It's a faith-filled way to look at the life that God has given to us. In Mark chapter 14, we see a story we want to look at really quick, and it's paralleled in, in Luke, which we already read earlier a few weeks ago in this series. But basically, it's the story of the, the sinful woman that found herself in the presence of Jesus. And Jesus did not seek to get rid of her, but, but she did certain actions toward him that showed that, that she believed that she had been loved much, and so in return, she was loving the Lord much. She had been changed, transformed from the inside out, so she could not help but worship him. Here's what we read happens in Mark 14, uh, verse, starting in verse 3. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating... A woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard. She broke open the bar, the jar and poured the perfume over his head. So what do we see happen? Again, this sinful woman who had a sinful reputation comes in, but she's been changed from the inside out. And she can't help but worship the Lord. And so what she chooses to do in that moment is not to store this expensive perfume, but instead to pour it out upon him. Now, again, there's some phrases in here that are kind of weird to us, like beautiful alabaster jar. None of us go, yeah, I got three of those last week at Sam's Club. We don't really know what that is, right? And then the essence of nard, right? We don't really understand what that is. But we do understand expensive perfume. We do understand what it is to have something expensive uh, in a bottle. And, and, and the reason it's expensive and why it's expensive is because it's still in the bottle. But if that bottle were to break, suddenly all the value it had, it's gone. At least in our minds. And so she breaks open this jar of perfume and pours it on the head of Jesus. And here's what's so interesting. When you decide to live by faith, there will always be outside critics. There will always be outside critics. And here's what's interesting. Here at this moment, some people spoke up in criticism of this woman. Verse 4, it says, Some of those at the table were indignant. Why waste such expensive perfume, they asked. It could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor. So they scolded her harshly. People spoke up. Even before social media, people shared their opinion. and said, why in the world would this person do this? Why would she do this? Now, did these people own the perfume? No, it wasn't theirs. Did they break it? No, it wasn't their actions. But they're criticizing someone else, trusting and worshiping God. Hey, listen, when it comes to living by faith, we will do certain things that get criticized. I, I know we talk about Chick-fil-A a lot as a, as a church, but I think, again, truly Kathy decided a long time ago, we're going to honor the Lord, and we're going to shut all of our restaurants down on Sundays as an act of worship. And that's got criticized over and over. It's got criticized by all church people who want to go there after church. Just so you know, like, we're all mad, right? But listen, he said, listen, I'm not trying to please you. I'm trying to please the Lord. And the Lord has blessed their sacrifice as a, no business wants to shut down one day a week. But they said, we're going to do this as an act of worship. And so again, there's outside critics. And in this moment, this, this person comes in and breaks open a perfume bottle and pours one on the head. People are like, you could have sold that. Now, none of them told their story. None of them said, you could have sold it like I sold it to perfume when I had some. And here's what I gave. None of them gave their own example. They just said, here's what you could have done. And so Jesus says, listen, leave her alone. Verse 6. Why criticize her for doing such a good thing to me? Listen, she's living by faith. She's showing worship. How dare you criticize her worship? and honoring of me. He says, you will always have the poor among you and you can help them whenever you want to, but you will not always have me. Is Jesus saying, don't take care of the poor in this moment? No. But he's saying, there will be always a chance to do good, no matter what generation you read this. But, he says for those in the room, for right now, 
Presently, right now, in this moment, you have me right here in this room with you. And I won't always physically be here in the room right now. He says, she has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. He says, listen, here's a bigger picture. She does not fully understand what she's doing, but God's going to use her act of worship to symbolize a coming sacrifice that I've been telling you about over and over again. I'm going to die. I will be buried. I will rise again. She doesn't know what she's doing in the grand scheme and scheme of things. She's just being faithful to what she knows in this moment. And here's how God will take her investment and have to be part of the gospel story. In fact, he says, listen, her story, what she's done today, will be told around the world. He could have said, it'll be mentioned in Jacksonville in October of 2019 at Oasis Church. She took an investment and chose to honor the Lord with it. She realized it was better to pour than to store. And her act of faith was part of telling the gospel story before Jesus Christ even went to the cross. And we recognize, again, there's something bigger going on when we trust the Lord. There's something bigger than us when we give to Him and give Him our time and energy and our finances. God created us to pour, not to store. The last instance of the scripture we want to see today is in Luke chapter 9. And to set it up a little bit, we see Jesus speaking at this event that has a lot of people at it. Sometimes, again, when you get, as a speaker, when you get more people at an event, you kind of go a little bit longer. It just kind of goes hand in hand with that. And you can imagine, again, that Jesus is there. And it says, it begins to say in Luke 9, verse 12, it says, late in the afternoon. Another version says, as the day wore on. So again, the day is going on. This is Jesus, the best teacher ever, right? The one who spoke with all authority. People are listening to his word. And it's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. But the day is wearing on. I have to go about 30 minutes, 35 minutes or so. And we all look at our watch about five times during this time. Even I look at my watch like, how much longer is this guy going to go? How much longer are we going to do this, right? So we kind of understand this. And so the day is unfolding. You can imagine the disciples, some of them, had a little power up. Like maybe John said, hey, Peter, come over here. Maybe, maybe, maybe James, come over here. Matthew, come over here. Maybe Bartholomew. And Bartholomew, we don't really know anything about him, but they're like, Barty, I guess you're here. Come on, come over to the party as well, right? Come on over. Right? They have a little power. They are talking. Maybe, maybe backstage or maybe again where they kind of, kind of can't do it. But maybe you can imagine they're all kind of like not, not wanting to say what's on their mind. Like, isn't this awesome? Yeah, James, James is like, yeah, things are going really great today. And Peter's like, yeah, this is amazing. Some of the stuff he said. I know he said it before, but he just sang it in a new way. And, and John's like, man, look how many people showed up. It's pretty awesome. They're kind of all kind of not wanting to say what's really on their mind. And maybe Bartholomew pipes up and goes, yeah, but it's been a long time. And so finally, like, ooh, someone mentioned it. So they all jump in like, yeah, yeah, I'm glad I know that too. It feels like a long time. I feel like the back row is kind of, kind of losing him attention a little bit. And yeah, we're kind of, maybe, maybe the people are getting hungry. So maybe we should tell Jesus. Maybe some one of us should go. Maybe we should gather together. Maybe we should just go interrupt Jesus and just say, hey, it's, it's getting a little late. Maybe we should do something. And maybe the disciples were bored. Maybe they were getting hungry. Maybe they were saying, you know what, Jesus, one time he didn't eat for 40 days. So maybe he's not hungry right now, but we got to tell him, hey, listen, we're, we're not the Son of God. We're, we're regular people. We're hungry, so maybe we should go, and, and let's just pull Jesus aside. So they kind of get their courage up. They go and talk, and here's what we read. Late in the afternoon, the disciples came to Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, send the crowds away to the nearby villages and farms so they can find food and lodging for the night. There is nothing to eat here in this remote place. Hey, hey Jesus, hey, man, what you're doing, great, great stuff. Love it. I'm not, not against that at all, but... You know, time's going on. Uh, people are hungry. It's going to get dark soon. Uh, you, you're speaking on a Sunday and chick fil A's closed. So there's no way that people can eat around here. And even if there was enough food around here, just look at the crowd. We, we can't feed everybody. So and maybe we break. Maybe we maybe have them come back next week or tomorrow for part two. And maybe like do a series. Think about that maybe. And, and just send them on their own way. Because it's getting late. Because people are going to be hungry. Maybe the disciples will really say, because I'm hungry and I'm tired. But Jesus said this, you feed them. You feed them. They're hungry. There's a need. You meet it. And they immediately go, but we only have five loaves of bread and, and two fish. They answered, are you expecting us to go and buy enough food for this whole crowd? 
For there are about 5,000 men there. So only the men are counted in this passage. So you can say easily between 10, 12, maybe 15,000 people if you add up the, the women and the children and the teenagers. Add up everybody. This is a big crowd. Do you really want us to go and, and go get, like, we only found a little bit of food, a couple biscuits and some fish sticks. God, this is all we have. And what do you want us to do? And it's interesting. Jesus did not panic and go, oh, no, I guess we don't have anything. Jesus didn't respond scarcely. They did. Here's all we have. How can we do all of that? But Jesus has an abundance mindset. So here's what he says. Jesus tells them, go and tell them to sit down in groups of 50 each. Now again, we read that. That's one little sentence. Can you imagine the time and effort involved to get 15,000 people in groups of 50? They don't even know how many 50 are. And you tell people to stand in a circle. They can't make a circle. Right? All these things are going on there. This is before they have speakers and, and megaphones. Like it took a while. But finally, everyone gets in groups of 50. So the people all sat down. Jesus takes the five loaves and the two fish, a little lunchable. He says this. Look up toward heaven and bless them. We don't have the prayer written down, but maybe some might have been said, well, God, thank you for this moment. God, you are going to be glorified in just a few moments. God, thank you for this food. Thank you for the person who brought this one lunch and was willing to give it. You can imagine that group of people, there were other lunches that people weren't willing to give it. Most likely, right? God, thank you for this one who's willing to give what they had. And God, as I bless this, would you bless the people? As this food is eaten, would you have this story go on to tell your glory recorded throughout history? God, you are good. You are abundant. You're able to provide. I don't know if you prayed that, but I can imagine that it might have been one line what you would have prayed. Then he began to, to break the food, break the loaves into pieces, and begin to give the bread and fish to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. So he prayed for it, then began to break it. And he was to break the bread and took some and gave it to to Peter. You can imagine Peter going to that first group of 50. Like, hey, imagine this is communion. Just take a little piece of bread. Right? Just, take a little, like, just, like, just get a little bit, right? Because I don't know how long it's going to go. So just take a little bit. Take a little bit. Little communion. Like little guy. Like little. Just don't, don't take that much. And then he goes back. And you know what? The other disciples had already gotten some. There's Jesus still breaking and giving. Still breaking and giving. Still breaking and giving. So Peter goes to the next group. And maybe he says, hey, you can take a little bit bigger piece. And, and he goes back a, a third time. Hey, you know what? Take a bunch. Right? Take it. And then he goes back to that first group. Hey, you know what? You you look like, I. thanks for taking a little bit, but we got a lot. Like, he keeps breaking. I don't know what's going on over there, but I keep bringing. And, here, and you can imagine again that the joy, the abundance. You think there was some laughter going on? Like, I'm sure there was some laughter. Like, we were, we were hungry. <laughs> Could you believe all that God is doing it? And here's this story going on. And then here's what the Word of God says. They all ate as much as they wanted. Like, it turned into a little comedian to a buffet. Like, seriously, how much do you want? Like, get full. Like, you go back for second thirds, fifths. Hey, we're praying for you. But come on back, man. Get, get as much as you want. And then the disciples were told, hey, go out, take a basket with you, go out and gather all the leftovers. Go to all the groups and see what's left over food. People can't finish anymore. And get it. And all the disciples came back and they gathered before Jesus. And what, they each had a, a basket. There were 12 baskets left over. And in that moment, basically Jesus was saying, listen, I know you're hungry, but you can trust me. I know we didn't have a lot of food, at least humanly speaking, but I, I don't do the things that humans do. It. I, I do the things that only God can do. You can trust in me. And, and so much so, hey, disciples, you were hungry and you wanted us to send everyone home. Now you all could go home, but you each have a doggy bag. And you remember this day. You remember this moment. It's awesome. And here what we see again is a principle that God teaches us. What we keep is all we have. But what we give, God multiplies. God's able to use it beyond what we think can be done. The time that we have is all that we have. But when we give God a portion of that time, He multiplies it. We can get more things done as we're giving to Him than if we just do our time and hold it on to ourselves. When it comes to uh, the encouragement or when it comes to the energy, when it comes to finances, if we hold on to it, that's all we have. But when we give it, that's when God multiplies it. Multiplies our efforts. Multiplies His kingdom. Multiplies the growth of His kingdom. Multiplies everything. We realize again, if that person had held on to their Lunchable, all they would have had with that lunch would be that Lunchable. But when they gave it, they realized that they were able to eat until they had enough. 
They were able to eat more than they brought themselves. We recognize again, what we keep is all we have. And when God multiplies it, when we give it to Him, He gets the glory. He gets the glory. So again, this is not just about finances. This is a mindset. This is about who we are. Are we investing our lives in the kingdom? Are we investing our lives as part of His church? Let me give you a, a few things to consider as we seek to be the church that God would have us to be. But when you come to Oasis, when you come a, as, as a regular part of Oasis, I want to encourage you. An investor says, this is my church. Someone who's not investing says, that's the church I go to. So I want to encourage you. Don't just go to Oasis. Have this be your church. Be the church that you're investing in. And so as you come and attend, I want to encourage you. Look at, as you walk up, look to the eyes of a first-time person. Are, are we being friendly just to each other, the people that we know? Or are we being friendly to the outsider? I want to encourage you to have that be in your mindset. Have that be that you're willing to take on. You know what? This isn't just the church I go to. This is my church. And I want to do my part to welcome everyone here at my church. To, to make sure everyone is connected here. As we walk in, I would encourage you to be praying. God, your words we preach today. God, I pray that there's people here that don't know you, but that they would know you today. God, I pray that you would save people through Oasis Church. And we're praying for the church. And we're praying for his word to be taught and for it to be accepted, for the church to grow, for God's kingdom to grow. If this is your church, I would encourage you to plan to be at Oasis. Don't let excuses creep up and get in the way of things that are important. Now, again, we all get sick and we all go out of town. But listen, if it's important, again, we don't want to look for an excuse of not to go. We need an excuse to go. I get to go to church. That is my church. I get to be part of the family of God there. I get to help other people know that God cares for them. When it comes to parking at Oasis, don't try to get the, the closest parking spot. Try to park one further away. Why? God, I'm leaving my space open for someone else to come to church and to find an easy spot and to come in and get connected here. I want to do this as an act of worship for you. I'm going to invest my parking spot. You know what else I'm going to invest, God? I'm going to invest my, my smile. Now, some of you guys, you're already really good at this. Some of you, it's time to practice. I'm just saying. Like, use a mirror, whatever. Take selfies, whatever. But listen, again, last week, we had no idea what a simple act or a word of encouragement can do to influence someone's life. Hey, listen, you have no idea how just a smile can change someone's life. To realize how people say, hey, listen, the guy that lives inside of me is the guy that's giving me joy. I'm going to let it show in my face. I, I, I want to be excited to be at the place that I get together as the church. I want to encourage you. Have this be a place of joy and let your face know it. It's okay. Let your face show it as well, right? I want to encourage you as well to be a people that when the service be begins, part of our investing in the kingdom of God is to participate. I'm all in. So when it's worship, I'm worshiping. And I'm focusing. I'm trusting in Him. I'm going where God would have us to go. When it's the teaching, my Bible's open. It's on my phone. I'm ready. I'm included. I'm wanted to go where we're going. When it comes to prayer, I'm praying. Listen, be encouraged. Be participate. Be all in. And so many of you, again, so many do so, many, uh, do so much. I encourage you, for those who are on the fringe, don't let this be the church you go to. Man, have this be your church. Join in with us. Have this be with us. And I encourage you again, especially at this service. I'm just a little side note. Hopefully not step on your toes too much, but it's going to hurt a little bit. Hey, listen, we start at 11 a.m. 11. <laughs> it, how it, it looks like this on your car dashboard, all right? It's ones and then zeros, all right? Why do I say that? Because this is important. So don't just attend the church. It be, you are the church. Amen. That's what I encourage you. Come in on time. Be here at 11. Be an example to those around you. And realize this is our church. We get to do this. If you're offended, I love you. It's okay, right? But 11 o'clock is what it is. Just so we know, right? I love you. I said that I love for you. And I want you to have this again to participate wholeheartedly. And then before when the service is over, don't be the first to leave. And pause. Maybe ask God before you leave. God, who do I need to smile? Who do I need to give a handshake to? Who do I need to find out their name? Who do I need to spend time just encouraging before I leave? I would encourage you to do that. And, and then persist. For those of you who are doing that already, keep doing those things. For those who need to start, and come on, let's go. Is this the church you go to or is this your church? I want you to invest. Be invested here at Oasis Church. We believe that God's kingdom is able to grow and there's more people in our area to reach 
Okay, there, the church landscape has changed a lot in our area. There's lots of more churches than there were when we started. But guess what? There's a lot more people than there were when we first started. We need to realize we are the church. And we're called to join alongside and realize that we get to be part of this together. So I want to encourage you. I'm learning this. Let's learn together. Let's trust the Lord together. Let's not have a scarcity mindset. Let's have an abundance mindset. Because the God who owns it all has given us a chance to honor Him with the portion what He's first given to us. Let's worship and trust in Him. Let's pray. Father God, as we close this time, I pray that we would recognize, for those who are trusting in You, recognize that we've been invited to the family of God. Thank You, Jesus, for Your salvation. Thank You for the good news that sets us free. We didn't earn it. We can't live in a way to, to try to pay it off. God, it's a gift. You've given us grace and mercy, salvation. We get to be part of your family. God, thank you for that. God, for anyone here today who's not yet received that, God, the invitation is for them. Holy Spirit, open up their heart to see that you're a God who loves and cares and has provided a way for them to know you. God, you've paid for their sin through your son Jesus upon the cross. They've been set free if they simply would believe and receive the gift of grace and mercy you've given to them. So God, I pray that even right now they would call out upon you, Jesus, to be their Savior, to believe that you died on the cross for them, that you were buried, and that you rose again, and you offered them new life. May they say yes to that today. For those of us who, again, who, are, who have been saved by you, God, help us to realize we're invaluable to your work. You want to use us. You don't need to use us, but you desire that we come alongside you and be used by you for your honor and glory. God, help us to be brave and be courageous, to speak, to serve, to give, to show what you would have us to do. God, give us the ability to realize that we are influencers. As your church, we are salt and light. And God, we will encounter people, many people, that we don't, do not see in this room this morning. God, may we not shrink back to influence them and encourage them and point them to you. And for God, for all of us, may we see that it's better to invest than to store. It's better to give than to receive. God, may that be true, not only with our finances, but with our time and our energy and our efforts as well. God, thank you again that you want us to build your kingdom. May we be used by you in a mighty way. What we hold on to, that's all we have. But what we give, Lord, you multiply. May we give to you this week and beyond. Thank you once again for who you are. And we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.